We're going to talk about closing demonic doorways. We're in our deliverance series. You know, this is what I love to do. I've been teaching, been preaching for many years. I just want to get into this tonight. If you have your Bible, let's go to Ephesians 4. And while you're going, I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you that it's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Anoint my lips of clay to speak as your oracle tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Ephesians 4 and verse 27. We're going to start there. Closing demonic doorways. And we're going to talk about four different types of doorways tonight. Now, I'm not saying this is the total amount of doorways. There's probably hundreds of doorways, right? But we're going to talk about these four. Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. So how many of us understand that means if it says don't give place, that means you can give place. Now, I need you to understand this, that when you got born again, the Bible declares, according to the book of Colossians and many other writings of Paul, that you are now born up above the power of hell. So we got to deal with this theology that we can just be walking down the street and the de devil just jump on us. Because some of y'all are afraid like that. Oh, you know, I, I, if I just talk to the wrong person, a demon's going to jump on me. Now, look, demons are invaders, and they look to invade spaces and places, but you need to understand this, that demons in the life of a Christian, someone say Christian, in the life of a Christian who's been born again, born out from under sin, out from under the world, demons do not have legal rights to just harass and torment and inhabit you. So demons are looking for doorways. A lot of times what happens in deliverance is we go down for prayer. I remember when I was getting delivered from rejection, and I went down for prayer and got my deliverance prayer and went back to my seat and felt better. But then the next day, guess what? That familiar demon showed back up. Why? Because I had to learn how to close certain doorways. And so tonight we're going to discuss four different types of doorways. The first type of doorway I want to talk about is what I call bloodline bondages. Sometimes you could call this ancestral spirits. You could call this generational curses. You could put a whole lot of different terms there. But bloodline bondages. Many of us are dealing with things that have been in our family line. I remember there was a woman in the first church I pastored, a Pentecostal woman. And I don't know if she couldn't have children or what the situation was, but she went and adopted a child. She had this little beautiful little boy. They came to the church, and one day she called me and said, I've got trouble with my boy. I said, what is it? I was bathing him, and he, the little kid was little too, I think, like maybe barely into kindergarten. And he turned and looked at me and spoke in a man's voice and said, I'm going to kill you. Now, I said, okay, we're going to come to your house and pray. This is a demon. We, just, we don't need to just, we got to come do a spiritual house cleaning on your house. So what she was dealing with, was a demon that had a bloodline doorway in the life of that child. Now, here's what I'm not saying, and I want you to be clear about this, and I don't have time to go into Colossians and all that stuff because I just want to get through these four points I want to make tonight. But, but you uh, bloodline bondages or ancestral spirits, I am not stating to you that when you get born again, they have a legal right to live in you. What I am stating to you is if they've been in your bloodline, they will often persist in their harassment and tormenting of you. And so you may find yourself dealing with stuff that you don't understand. Why am I dealing with this? But then you find out your grandmother dealt with that. Or you find out your father dealt with that. Or you found out your mother dealt with that. And I've seen cases like this where children are adopted and the children that have been adopted are raised in a home that is filled with faith and the word of God yet they are dealing with things that are tied into the bloodline so these are doorways that have been opened by members of your family many times this predates your birth so you don't know about it you don't know that your family uh, two generations back was involved in witchcraft but then you go out and you you uh, play one time with the Ouija board and now spirits are coming to your house moving stuff around but your neighbor played with a Ouija board nothing happened well why did this happen to me because this spirit has been in the bloodline and persisting in the bloodline and so sometimes we are dealing with a warfare and dealing with demonic temptation and dealing with demonic attacks that are associated with the bloodline now we have to understand this demons are personalities without bodies so if you're a personality without body a body you need a host to live in, 
to act through in the earth. If you're a spirit of lust and you want to manifest lust in the earth realm, you need a human to operate through. There are three things demons will live in. They'll live, their first choice is people. Secondly, they'll live in animals. We see this when Jesus cast the legion out of the demoniac. What happened? The, the, they went in. The word, the word legion indicates about 6,000 demons. There was, uh, I think, 2,000 pigs, if I remember correctly. So that, uh, that's what, three demons per pig went in there. And then the pigs couldn't stand the demons, so they killed themselves. Well, we wonder, why are so many people killing themselves? Demons. They're tormented and harassed, and they don't, they're not finding help, and they just, they, 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 that's what happens. Many people are killing themselves slowly. They're killing themselves through drugs. They're killing themselves through the way they treat their bodies. They're killing themselves. Through, they know that the doctor said, you have a blood pressure problem. I remember I had a woman in my church, and the uh, first church I pastored, she had diabetes. And she uh, got on a, a supplement. There was a, a juice she got on, and she, she, her blood sugar normalized. And then she'd get, do that for six months and get off the juice and start eating all kind of sugar and ask for a prayer. And I finally told her, I'm not going to keep praying for you. I'm going to pray for your mind to work right, but I'm not going to pray for your body because you keep doing the thing. Now, you're laughing, but this is true. You keep doing the thing that is making you sick. And you have a solution over here, but you're not doing it. And sometimes even that's a bloodline demon. Everybody in a family has all dealt with a certain health problem and certain eating problems, and, 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 and we can't seem to get victory over that. So these spirits are looking. They're, they're living people. They're living animals. The third thing, they're living objects. I had a pastor friend that years ago, their home started to experience demonic problems. And they went to praying about it, couldn't figure it out. And one of them had been on an international trip and brought something home. And, you know, I've traveled all over the world. I remember the first time I went to Central America. I was looking at this art. I was so pretty. And then someone told me, oh, don't buy that. I said, why? They said, that's involved with Mayan worship. Well, I wouldn't have known. So I would have bought it. That's why you got to, you know, you go out to other countries. You got to pray over those things. Uh, you don't have to operate in fear. The Holy Ghost is with you. You have dominion. So if that spirit's living that thing, you cast it out. But if the thing is associated with spiritual stuff, you just don't need the thing. And so often people deal with that. You remember Paul was preaching and revival broke out and they burnt all the books. Well, they weren't burning the books and burning the objects just to have a bonfire. They were burning those things because of their association with witchcraft. When I see Christians go out and get various uh, worship objects, I don't want to start getting into all that because there's so many things we could talk about. But various worship objects... It's, oh, this is so beautiful, and put it in your house, and then you can't sleep at night. You're depressed. You're anxious. You're having all these problems. Well, I don't understand what it is. It may be something in your house. So these spirits operate through the bloodline. Now, here's what you have to understand. When people die, demons don't die. So they will bounce from family member to family member to family member. Let's talk about some types of bloodline demons. A big one is addiction. Medical science will tell us, and I'm not saying they're wrong. They'll tell us sometimes that's a chemical thing in people's bodies. But I also believe it can be a spiritual thing. Grandfather was addicted. Dad was addicted. Son is addicted. Right? Another type of bloodline demon may be mental instability or mental attacks. And I believe that, you know, that can be, uh, that can be medical and, and things beyond just spiritual, but there's definitely a spiritual component to that. And so a lot of times, we're dealing with stuff our family dealt with. Another thing uh, uh, is uh, sexual bondage or sometimes promiscuity. I'm just going to write bondage. Perversion. What's another type of bloodline? Someone call out another thing. Poverty. That's a good one. So let's, poverty now, let's go a little bit. The Bible said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, right? So with poverty, there's a mindset. Every demon has a mindset. One of the biggest mindsets with poverty is what? Scarcity. How many of you are watching stupid TikToks about the economy right now? Did I spell that right? I hope I did. Scarcity. Uh, so, so we get scared. Oh my gosh, the economy's going to crash. Da, 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 da. Do you know every economic crash, people got rich? The thing that positions you is a mindset. So you got to deal with your mindset 
Now, we have a scarcity mindset. What do we do? We go buy stuff we don't need. I remember I went to Cancun years ago. I won't go to Cancun no more. I saw someone have a conference in Cancun. I said, God bless your heart. People are shooting each other there. I'm not going to Cancun. So y'all want to go, y'all go, but I'm not going. But I was in Cancun and a Category 5 hurricane came. Category 5 hurricane came. They said, we're going to evacuate you. I said, to where? To the movie theater. All the planes were full. We couldn't get a flight out. Thank God our spiritual mother, Miss Ronnie, was still alive. We called Miss Ronnie. I said, if anyone can pray us out of this, this is Miss Ronnie. We walked out on our balcony. We had an ocean front room. We were so excited. That was after, by the way, we got sick. That's another reason I don't really love vacation in Mexico. We got sick. We in our room for three days. Came out. Heard people talking about a hurricane. And so we came out uh, from the room, and people were talking about the hurricane. We get evacuated, and, and we go out in the balcony before we leave. When I'm commanding the ocean, be still. I'm saying this storm has to pass over us. You can't happen here. And, and uh, we're packing our stuff, and they say, you can only take one bag. We're hiding stuff. We got stuff stuffed down in here, stuff stuffed down everywhere. Why? Because scarcity, right? We're afraid if we get stuck, we're going to be in trouble. We get to the, the, the movie theater, and there's about 500 of us there. We got to sleep on the floor in the movie theater. This is not how I envisioned this vacation. And they put out food, and they said, just get what you need. Well, Joy and I are getting extra food and hiding it. I don't know what we think we're going to do, because if people go to starve, they'll be like, but we just think we're just going to survive this storm, man. And so they come and make an announcement and say, we have plenty of food. Don't take more than what you need. Long story short, that Cat 5 went down, passed over us. We did get the bands of it. We were totally unaffected, and God preserved us and protected us. But I'm telling this story to say we, were, we had a scarcity mindset. Every demon has a mindset. When Paul is dealing with strongholds, they are systems of thoughts. So if a demon has a personality, a personality has a mindset. The Bible said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So a major component of deliverance is not only closing these doorways we're talking about tonight, but it is also dealing with the mindset. So if I'm going to come out of any of these things, I've got to deal with the mindset. I want to say this. Some of you may be dealing with things that are in your bloodline, and you've not done the investigation or the the introspection to examine what you're dealing with. Let me give you a scripture really quick that will, that will make sense why this could even happen. Exodus 20 and verse 5. I realize this is the Old Testament. Remember what I said earlier? I said that if you're born again, you're born out from under this, right? But demons understand legality. So demons will try to come and to get you caught up in a bunch of mess. Exodus 25. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, and a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children uh, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So a lot of times we're dealing with it. So that, do you know what demons are common in your bloodline? Anybody ever get married and then you discover your spouse has demonic behaviors? Sometimes I deal, do counsel with people. And usually people go, I'm having this problem. I want to get a divorce. And I'll ask this question. What was your childhood like? Because that's where it all started. That's where you learned the you that is today was developed in childhood. And to get deliverance, anything that came was passed down that should have been passed to you, you've got to intentionally do deliverance work. Now, these things don't just fall off of you. Demons have to be cast out. Demonic thoughts have to be cast out. Demonic strongholds or systems of thought have to be changed. It takes work to get your deliverance. The Bible declares, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. So answer number one to this mess up here, I've got to recognize it. You cannot confront what you don't identify. Why is it some families, every, every couple's been divorced? It's a bloodline doorway. Why is it some family, everybody's poor? You ever seen people that make a lot of money and they're still poor? I've sat with people that make $100,000, $120,000, have nothing. You know why? It's this thing over here we call it out, poverty. It's a spirit and a mindset. They'll make that money and spend it as fast as they can make it because it's scarcity. Stuff, they feel like they need stuff to feel better. Scarcity is a mindset. So you need to begin to identify, what is it? My family had a lot of mental problems. My, uh, I had schizophrenic people in my family 
People manic depressed are now called bipolar. Y'all don't be joy, don't be making jokes about this. <laughs> I'm delivered. Uh, but my family had a lot of that, those problems. The other side of my family had a huge problem with promiscuity. I don't want to call out names, but certain family members of mine slept with every woman they could find. So I go off to Bible school. Well, first of all, in junior high, I want to kill myself. Where did that come from? Bloodline demons. I go off to Bible school, and I'm having all this lust and all this stuff. Where did that come from? Bloodline demons. Then when you begin to participate in those areas that are familiar to the demons that run in your family, those demons take you into behavior that is eerily familiar. You become addicted when you only do the thing one time, and other people did it ten times before they got addicted, but it's a familiar demon to your bloodline. And a lot of us live in this area, so how do I get free from bloodline spirits? So we're going to pray over all these doorways tonight. Here's what you need to do to get free. Number one, you need to renounce it. So I am not partnering with whatever it is. I renounce whatever it is. You need to renounce it. You need to cut affiliation with activities that feed those demons. Stop doing stuff that those demons are craving and enforce your spiritual position as a new creation. So you need to get scriptures. Like my family, I remember sitting with the doctor. Could you come and just leave this, but maybe just erase from here over if you, so like, just straight down over. Um, I, I remember going and meeting with a doctor, and people in my family had diabetes. And the doctor said, you better watch your blood. But I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm a new creation. And because I'm a new creation, I don't have that in my blood. Well, but you know, Ryan, that I said, I understand what you're saying medically, and I appreciate it. But spiritually, I'm standing on the word of God. I'm not going to have that because the word of God says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, diabetes can't live in my body. So I don't care if grandpa was crazy. I don't care if grandma got divorced three times. That is not your portion. So you've got to begin to get in the Word of God and stand on what the Word of God says and tell those demons, you can't have me. And you begin to speak the Word of God. You begin to declare the Word of God. Amen. Now, the second one, oh, this is a big one, relational doors. I feel like these, these markers need deliverance. Whoever picked my markers, we're going to have a meeting after service. Ah, this one's good. Owen picked this one, I think. I heard him shout. Shandy picked the first one. I feel it in my spirit. Relational doors. Relational doors. Now, let's talk about some types of relation doors. Impartation. Some of you are dealing with demons you picked up at a prophetic meeting. One of the most demonized women I ever saw went to a meeting in the Bahamas and swallowed a beam of light for an hour. That's why, for me, when people start talking stuff that's not in the Bible, and just, well, it's just mysteries, things, I'll just stick with the Bible. Y'all do all this stuff, I'm just going to stick with the Bible. Oh, but they, get, they called my neighbor, they gave this, they gave that, I don't care. Some of us are dealing with impartation issues. Some of us are dealing with friendships. The Bible said not to make friends with an angry man lest you learn his ways. There's a level of impartation that comes from your friends. Some of us are dealing with uh, sexual relationships, past and present. Current, later on after service, we'll have to pray for you. Some of you are doing, doing it online. Soul ties. I mean, now we got technology, right? There are all kinds of ways we could sin. Soul ties. <laughs> And then here's a big one for people in the church, ties to former leaders. Controlling leaders, manipulative leaders will get in your soul. I've counseled people whose leader made sexual advances towards them. In fact, went so far as to say, God sent you to this ministry for this purpose. Some people are dealing with ties to former leaders, relational doors. Now, let's go to the Bible. Romans 1.11, Paul says, I long to see you that I might impart on you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. This tells me something. It tells me that relationship is ordained for connectivity, and connectivity is necessary for impartation. Impartation is a release from one person or place to another. God releases something to you. Paul said to Timothy, stir up 
up the gift that is in you by the putting on of my hands, right? Uh, Proverbs 22, 24 through 25 is the scripture I quoted. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. Some of you have the wrong friends. Oh, but I, you know, we've been friends forever, but your friends got demons. And you're getting in the deliverance line on Sunday and coughing it up, and then you're going on Monday and Tuesday, and they're just filling your ears. It's okay in a friendship to say, hey, I can't listen to that. I can't talk about that. I, can't, I don't want to hear all that. I don't want to go down that road with you. And so many times we're dealing with demons and demonic doorways through our friendships. Uh, what is a soul tie? A soul tie is the knitting of two souls. The emotional heart and mind. It's the knitting of them together. Now personally, I believe there can be positive soul ties and negative because Jonathan and David had a soul tie that was for a kingdom purpose. Right? But I believe there can be negative. Uh, a lot of times, soul ties are established when you share the contents of your heart. What happened to Samson? Delilah pressed him daily till he shared the contents of his heart. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm not saying this about anybody. I've said this for many years, so don't feel like I'm saying this about anyone in this room or anybody online. But oftentimes, when people start dating in the church and they get really deep and start prophesying to each other, praying over each other for hours, you begin to form a soul tie. And then if God deals with you, this isn't the person you're supposed to be married or there's, that you're supposed to marry. There's an issue that arises. You don't feel comfortable exiting because you've tied in with that person. Now, it's impossible to date someone and not have some kind of a soul tie. That's why really I believe Christians should not date just to date. Christians should date to marry, Right? And so we should be vetting these relationships up front as much as we can. Soul ties can be deformed by, uh, by for, or developed by forming an unhealthy emotional dependence on someone. I've seen, I remember there was a woman I dealt with years ago, and, and she, uh, she just, she was, she loved the Lord. She was married to a preacher, but she had this need if she wasn't, she, you know, these women have girls' nights and girls' days and girls' this, and this lady had children and a husband, and it was constant. Like, she was every, I, if I don't have four girls' days a, a week, I'm depressed and I'm upset. And when she would become friends with people, it's like she'd attached herself to them. And I remember counseling with, with her family. And say, look, you got to back off of some of this. It's too much. It's okay. There, it's a healthy thing that as a woman, you want interaction with other women and you want relationship. But you're forming dependence. And dependence can develop into toxicity. And so a soul tie is often developed from that. And, and really in relationships, soul ties will start to derail covenant relationships. When married people are spending most of their time with someone other than their spouse... That's problematic. When people have children and they don't spend any time with their children, but they're always, I'm going here after work and I'm going there and I'm going to do this. That's problematic. We have to learn how to prioritize relationships in our life because every relationship has a purpose. Relationships are God's transportation system. When he wants to elevate you, when he wants to correct you, when he wants to release a spiritual gift to you, he sends a relationship. A lot of you are praying for God to do what people are supposed to do in your life. Soul ties are formed by sex. All facets, all forms. I know sometimes we say certain things, that's not really sex. If stuff is, if air is hitting certain parts of your body that it wouldn't normally hit, you're in sexual contact with somebody. Okay? Let's just make it real simple. That everybody can understand. 1 Corinthians 6.16, keep it holy, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two shall become one flesh. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So the principle is that I know that we say we can have sex with people and not get emotionally tied. And maybe for some of you that has been your experience, but I can assure you 
There is a knitting that happens in sexual activity, and it doesn't always have to be intercourse. It can be other forms of sexual activity that you become knit to somebody. And the deeper thing is, is that oftentimes you're becoming knit to the people they've been knit with. So now you're knit to multiple people. And now I remember counseling somebody that was married. They were married to this person, a great person, a person that loved God. But they were fantasizing about this other abusive, horrendous person. But they had a sexual soul tie with this other person. So now they're married having children and God's moving in their life over here. But their mind is wandering back over here. What was it? Was there problems here? There may have been problems here. But the reality was there was an uncut soul tie back over here. So in relationships, that's a major open door. Now, how do we, how do we deal with this? Oh, one more scripture, Ephesians 5.31. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother. This is a whole marriage teaching. I don't have time. Didn't say get married and take your parents with you. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, not his mother, not his father, and the two shall become one flesh. There's a, a unification that happens. So when you're doing the activity of marriage without the covenant of marriage, you are connecting you are tying, but without the covenant part of it. So how do I get deliverance in this area? Number one, and we're going to erase the board and go to the last two. Re recognize the wound. Ask the Holy Spirit, do I have a soul tie? Do I have wrong friends somewhere? Do I have ties to my former leaders that were manipulative and abusive? Do I act out certain ways because I wasn't affirmed, because this, because that, because this? And understand that deliverance is personal. If you answer yes to any of these things I'm saying, it is nobody else's responsibility to get you delivered. Look, when you stand before Jesus, I'm not standing with you. Pastor Owen is not standing with you. Pastor Tay is not standing with you. Nobody else standing with you. You are standing there. So if you got this going on in your life, you better put your combat boots on and you better get to work. So the first step is you got to recognize the wound. Where is there a wound? Be honest. And then own up to your own role in it. If you got a soul tie, it didn't just happen to you. You participated in it. Own up to that. Then pray a prayer of repentance. God, I'm sorry I did A, B, C. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Pray a prayer of repentance. And then break any tie with the wound and the pain by renunciation. So if I'm dealing with a soul tie, I wrote a soul tie prayer years ago. I don't even know. I probably have it somewhere. If I'm praying over soul tie, I, Lord, I break every soul tie with Suzanne or whoever. Call their name out. Oh, but I feel some type of way. That's called deliverance. You think about that person, start getting upset, that's called deliverance. That's exactly what that should do when you're cutting that tie. And so you renounce it and break it with your mouth. Can you come and help me erase? Why do we need to do that? We're priests and kings. What do priests and kings do? They minister to the Lord and they decree, they legislate. So when we begin to break that, we are legislating. All right, y'all? Now we're going to go into the next one. Uh, divination and occult activity. Divination and occult activity. The scripture is Leviticus 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, wizards, to go whoring after them, I will set my face against that soul and will cut him off from amongst his people. I'll cut him off. So one of the ways the enemy brings enchantment is familiar spirits. They imitate people. So when you see somebody, thank you, Kelton. When you see somebody... A psychic and says, your grandmother Dolores says that she, she still has those red shoes that you bought. And you're, they're crying, oh, God, because they really bought the red shoes. How did that happen? How did that psychic know that? The psychic knew that because demons talk. That's called clairvoyant activity. So they're getting accurate information, but they're getting it from demons, not the Holy Spirit. So familiar spirits imitate people. Familiar spirits imitate the Holy Spirit. What did the Bible say? Satan will come as an angel of light. Do you know that some demons imitate tongues? Demonic tongues? They speak in other languages. What is tongues? Tongues is the language of angels. Now, I know the different theologies. Personally, I believe demons are fallen angels. Some believe they're descendants of Nephilim. Either way, I believe that demons understand heavenly activity. And they can imitate certain things. That's why when your Shando says no, y'all know what your Shando is, right? That's your tongue-talking part. 
When Yashando says, no, that's not for me, you better listen. You better listen. Because the enemy will begin to draw you to the wrong space. So you need to understand enchantment begins oftentimes when people crave power without consecration. I want you to write this scripture, Deuteronomy 18. When thou art come into the land which the Lord gives you, thou shalt not learn after the abomination of these nations. This was talking to Israel, everybody, other, the pagan nations. You shall not make his son or daughter pass through the fire. He that uses divination, an observer of the times. Well, I read my horoscope and, you know, somebody online said it's okay. They're a Christian. Well, they're lying. A horoscope is a false prophecy. The Bible talks about that. Well, but what if, what if we're wrong? Right? Well, I'd, I'd rather be wrong on the side of holiness. So I'd just rather be wrong on that side. We don't need to open up. We're talking about demonic doorways, right? Observer the times and chanter, a witch, a charmer, consulted with familiar spirits. I told you familiar spirits imitate dead people. That's what it's talking about. A wizard, a necromancer. That is really comes from the concept of romance with the dead. But I would say this. We used to always think of that in terms of very vile sexual practices. But necromancy, I believe, you see all this obsession like with skulls and all this stuff. I believe there's a spirit behind that. Now, I'm not terrified if I'm in the store and there's one of those uh, people are talking about online now, the liquid death. But I'm not scared of that, okay? But in reality, I'm not going to go buy a skull painting and put it up in my living room. So it asked me the other day, what do you think about tattoos? I said, I don't really get worked up about it. There are two groups of thought. There are one group of thought that if you do that, you're getting a blood covenant with people. To, the problem I have with that is if I go to the dentist and my gum bleeds, it's the, then I'm making a blood covenant with the dentist. Then the other side of that thought is Jesus is coming back with a tattoo on his thigh. So we have these two extreme different opinions, right? But I was saying to the person, I said, I definitely wouldn't go get no crab tattoo, no skull tattoo, no snake tattoo, no spider tattoo. Why? Because you're, you're marking yourself with images that are connected to things you don't want to be connected with. So Israel was warned about that. Believers are forbidden from spiritual practices not rooted in the Bible. For example, tarot cards. We're not to be reading tarot cards. I know there was a group of Christians that made spirit cards. I don't want no spirit cards either. I have a Bible. I don't need a spirit card. Fortune telling. We're not supposed to do that. Uh, okay, I won't say that, Lord. Astrology. We need to stay away from that. Psychics. Zodiac signs, new age concepts. Don't talk to me about people's auras, people's vibes. Manifesting. Well, I'm manifesting this and manifesting that. That's really a perversion of faith. Faith calls those things to be not as though they were. So stick with faith and keep it biblical. Don't be out trying to manifest. Oh, I manifest. I, you know, uh, there's a celebrity that said she manifested her husband. The devil is a liar. The Bible said that God created man. You didn't create anybody. And when we begin to think that way, we're operating in witchcraft because we're placing ourselves above God. We don't manifest things in that way. We speak things according to the Word of God. And our words are powerful, and our words can come to pass if they're lined up with God. But we are servants of the Most High God. We don't go and manifest our will. Mm -mm, we don't have time for that. Thanking the universe. I don't know. I don't, I don't thank the universe. I thank Yahweh, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. That's who I thank. There's only one God. I'm not thank. Well, God, you know, God, I see now people talk about God is a woman. The Bible doesn't say that. You get in, in that place and you get in trouble. Because you're operating mysticism. I don't have time for healing crystals. Somebody said to me, well, you know, the, the, the priests had crystals. Uh, they did. Every stone represented something. Colors represent things. Stones represent things. Here's where it gets wrong. When we begin to think there's power in that stone, the power is in God. That's where the power is at. So when we begin to look for physical objects to bring power into our lives, I don't care what the object is, we are getting off course. Israel was warned, don't do that. So that's a major open door that happens. What do I do if I've been involved in this? Well, number one, you repent. Now, the Greek word for repent is met nail. It means to think differently after. Are you all okay? I know usually I'm screaming and we're hooping and we're running, but we're teaching tonight. Are you all with me? You know, we only get one service in person a week. When we start having two, we can do this uh, on the second one, right? But, but we're teaching tonight. And so we've got to repent. 
God, I'm sorry. God, I, I, I shouldn't have done that thing. I shouldn't have played with those tarot cards. Lord, I repent. And we, that's the beginning. And then we renounce. I break association with that spirit in Jesus' name. I don't belong to that camp. I'm delivered. I'm saved. We begin to speak the word. And then we destroy any physical objects or get rid of them tied into divination. Some of you need to do a spiritual house cleaning. I had a lady, the first church I came to. This is a wild story. We would be in worship and someone would start lifting her off her feet. She'd start doing like this. Rise it up. We'd go over there and hold her down. Then she came to me and said, Pastor, something is coming into my house. And I said, what is it doing? She said, it's coming into my house, and it's uh, coming in there and moving things around. I said, okay, I'm going to come to your house. I used to do that a lot. I I don't do it that much anymore, but I used to do a lot. I'm going to come to your house. You know, when you're young, you're just excited. I'd cast devils out of dogs, animals. I used to go street soul winning at midnight. Just go out the streets. And when I used to pick up hitchhikers and prophesy to them. I was crazy, I got to say. And so I, I went to her house, and, and we began to cast the devil out of her house. And broke the power. We found out she had bloodline demons of occult activity and witchcraft. And she had just played around a little bit with the Ouija board and opened the door for all this stuff. And so we went through her house. You go, how do I do a spiritual house clean? Let me give you a five-minute lesson. Number one, you get some anointing oil. Why don't I have any anointing oil? Get olive oil, pray over it, consecrate it. Don't use it to cook your peanuts or anything else. And this is for oiling my house. Now, I did years ago see a tent preacher that forgot to bring the oil and asked, did anyone have oil? And a man said, we, I have some, some motor oil. I said, I am not getting in that line. The devil is a liar. He got the motor oil, and when this preacher prayed, he prayed like that, smacked you. He got the motor oil. It was going in the hair on their clothes, black oil, green oil. But you get some oil and pray over it, consecrate it, dedicate it to God, Go through every doorway and every window in your house and anoint it. In Jesus' name, I anoint this door. No demons can enter into my house. Lord, you said everywhere the sole of my foot treads upon is mine to take. I claim this house for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, I bind and break every demonic force. In Jesus' name, Lord, I'm asking you that angels would stand guard around my house. In Jesus' name, I decree that no weapon formed against my family prospers. I decree that sickness can't live in my house. Disease can't live in my house. Demonic powers can't live in my house. Lord, you said you gave me power and authority over all demons, and I forbid demons to enter these doorways and these windows. Any demons in this space, I command you, get out in Jesus' name. I command you, leave my house. If you have teenagers, you might have to do that every week. Because they're bringing them in while you're getting them out. Anoint your house. Then walk through your house and pray in tongues. If you've been involved in any of the things I just walked through, yes, pray. And let the Holy Ghost lead you. When I would do spiritual house cleaning, I walked the little boy that told his mother he wanted to kill her. When I did the house, I said, let me in his room. I walked through. There was a cartoon that had a witchcraft. I got, he had a comforter. and pulled that over here. There's a There's a character over here. I got that over here. I had a big mound of stuff this high. I said, we need to burn or throw all this out. She said, Brother Ryan... That's $500 worth of stuff. Now, when I was younger, I was also more blunt. I said, do you want your demons or your 500 bucks, lady? I don't have time to mess with you. She said, I'm keeping that stuff. I said, I'm out. I told the prayer team, come on, we're going. You keep your demons. And we left. And the kid ended up in all kind of trouble. But you can do a spiritual house cleaning on your house. If you live in an apartment and your neighbor's demonized, you can still cleanse your house. You can't control that your neighbor has demons, and you might be the key to your neighbor's deliverance. You're over there cleaning your house, and the Holy Ghost might just slip through your door into the neighbor's house over there. Watch how God might use you. Some of you that are renting, this is why I think God wants us all to own our own property, to tell the devil he can't have our property. I used to know Christian real estate investors that go drive stakes in the ground and write scriptures on them and claim their property for God. We need to be bold and claim territories for God. Amen. All right, the last open door is trauma and abuse. This is like the family part, right? This wasn't something that we did to ourselves. You didn't ask for trauma and you didn't ask for abuse. 
but it happens. We live in a fallen world. People struggle. Well, why did this happen to me? Because there's demons and there's people. That's the two reasons these things happen. So trauma and abuse can create emotional wounds that become doorways to spiritual activity in your life. Because pain creates belief systems. When you, don't raise your hand, but any of you ever went through so much disappointment, you just stopped believing it could get better. You would rather just be okay with what you have. That's trauma. And that's operating in some of your lives. You don't try. You only try this, this level because of the trauma, because of the pain. Pain creates belief systems in our hearts that need to be uprooted. And these foundational belief systems unlock direction in our life. Because our life is moving in the direction of our dominant thought. So you can come in the prayer line and get hands laid on you Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But if you don't deal with the pain, you've got a doorway in your life. What are some examples of this? Well, uh, uh, a rejection mindset. And rejection is a whole word in and of itself. I think I taught on that last week. So rejection can manifest control. Because we want safety and control can feel like safety. Rejection can uh, manifest as a a need for uh, abnormal amounts of attention and affection. You know, it's like you go into a room, nobody else can have a conversation because you've got to suck all the oxygen out of the room. You form relationships with people and your expectations are up here. Normal is about here. And the person comes in down here or here and you're frustrated, you're angry. So you're the cutoff king or the cutoff queen. You quit churches God sent you to because you didn't feel affirmed. And sometimes what you define as affirmation is not even normal. It's not even normal relationship activity. But you have a mindset of rejection. Uh, Another difficult mindset a lot of us deal with is a fear mindset. We're just fearful all the time. Fear is a big one that can manifest as control as well. Fear is a partner of anxiety. The Bible said perfect love casts out all fear. Jesus is perfect love. Perfect love is not a thought, idea, or concept. It's a person. And so people with a fear mindset manifest control. People with a fear mindset uh, does all kind of things. People are afraid of the dark. They're afraid of flying. How many people have never went on a trip anywhere because they're terrified to get an airplane? Statistics tell us you're more likely to die in a car. But fear, fear has a voice. Fear talks. So that, that thing will manifest in all different directions. There's a lot of these. Uh, another one, uh, some people uh, deal with continual anger. You're just angry. So what happens with this one is you get angry at the wrong things and the wrong people. You're angry because somebody did something to you in church, but that's not really why you're angry. You're angry because of something that happened years ago that you've never dealt with. And when you're put in the right tension, it pulls what's up out. But the problem with this is all of these things have spirits. Fear is a spirit. The Bible tells us God's not giving you the spirit of fear. Anger. I believe there's spirits of rage and anger. People get into rage and anger. Rejection. I believe there's all kind of spirits tied to rejection. What did the Bible say? You are accepted in the beloved. God came, Jesus came to annihilate the work of rejection in your life. So I want to give you three tools that I believe are necessary for your emotional healing. And I told you we were only doing four doors. There's probably 15 more we could do. Three tools, write these down. Number one, rhythm. You have to find the right rhythm that is healthy for your soul. A lot of people have unhealthy rhythms. In Mark 6, uh, Jesus, the apostles gathered themselves together and Jesus told them all the things they'd done. So the apostles come to Jesus, guys, and they say, Jesus, we did this and we did that and we did this. Now, how many of us prophets, if somebody came and said, 15 wheelchairs got emptied in, 30 and say, we'd be like, yes, let's go and prophesy some more. But watch what Jesus does. Could you put the scripture back up, please? He gathered them all things, what they had done, what they had taught. He said, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Jesus did not say, let's go minister more. He said, we're going to rest. He understood something called rhythm. There's a power in the rhythms of your life. Prayer is a rhythm. You need to find time to pray. If you're a late night person, unless the Lord tells you differently, that might be your prayer spot. If you're an early morning person, that might be your prayer spot. Some of you may have a short attention span. I was shocked when Oral Roberts told me he prayed in 15-minute increments because he had a short attention span. 
I thought to be deep, you had to pray 45 minutes to an hour every time. But God knows your personality. One problem we have with intercession, let me just say this is not in my notes, is a lot of the most powerful intercessors are women. And thank God for women, the church would be in trouble without women. Amen? You want to get a revival going? Get, a, get an on fire for God woman. You want to run devils out? Get an on fire for God woman. But one issue that happens in intercession is the women want the men to pray like the women. And many of us are logic driven. So we don't let it, we gotta lay on the floor for two hours. We're thinking about we got to move the chair. We got to do this thing. Got to do that thing. Got to do this thing. And we spend our lives thinking we're not deep. Come on, we're not deep because our favorite intercessor is this powerful. I was in a conference, and the woman said, all right, everybody, we're going to give Jesus a big kiss. I said, I'm not, lady. Like, you lost your mind. She's up there. Give the Holy Spirit a hug. I said, no, I'm not, ma'am. Let's talk about swords, fighting. Let's do Old Testament and stuff. Come on, let's do something. But a lot of times we don't understand that. So everybody's rhythm is going to be different and we can become critical because somebody's rhythm isn't the same. So if you will begin to find your rhythm, it's going to help your emotions be healed. Secondly is the roots. Oftentimes, so rhythm, then roots. We deal with the fruit, but we overlook the root. Trauma has a root system. Trauma has an entry point. Sometimes we need to pause when we're in a time of deliverance, you know, come out, come out, come out. Sometimes we need to pause. And we need to go to the root system. How long have you had fear? All of my life. What brought it on? Well, I was left alone in the car in the dark when I was four years old. Let's go back to that place and get you healed and then this demon has to come out. Sometimes we need to identify the doorway. There's a root. Jesus cursed the fig tree by the root. This is a biblical model of how transformation happens. So Jesus did not point at the leaves and curse the leaves. We're pointing at the leaves and curse the leaves. We're dealing with behaviors. We're dealing with attitudes. We deal with those things, and those things are connected to a root. But real deliverance work happens at the root. Where did this mindset enter into your life? Because spirits have mindsets. So we got to deal with the rhythm. We got to deal with the roots. Are you all still with me? All right, y'all, if you got trauma, this last one will be hard. Relationships. Healing happens in community. Isolation is one of the first things we do in certain types of pain. We get in pain. You ever been in pain? I remember different injuries I've had, and my wife or different people love me like, are you okay, are you okay? And just intuitively, leave me alone. Why? I, just, I don't know if I'm okay. I just need a minute. First tendency in pain is to isolate. You have a bad day. How many men can relate to this? You have a bad day, and your spouse asks you what's wrong. And you don't want to talk about what's wrong. You might not even know what's wrong. You just know something's wrong. You're frustrated. But, but what they ask, what's wrong? What's wrong? We want to isolate, but certain types of healing happen best in community. Why? Because guess what's going to happen? We get in community and someone doesn't talk to us, right? Oh, that big old rejection is going to raise its head. Watch this now. And we ask for deliverance. But then when Prophet Tay goes, you know what? That, that right now, what you're, that's rejection. Dad, you're not going to talk to me like this. I'll tell you. Da, 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 da. Well, wait a minute. I thought last week God sent you here. Because with community, there comes accountability. Your demons can hide when you're isolated, but they cannot hide when you have connectivity with other people. And this is the thing. Exposure is not about embarrassment. Exposure is about deliverance. God is bringing something up to the top so he can set you free. And freedom happens in community. Jesus did his best work in community. Jesus did the biggest miracles in community. Jesus did the most radical deliverances in community. And I believe God is trying to raise up churches that don't don't just want to give us five steps to a better life and three jokes and four. You know, someone said, well, the church just needs more dramas and more skits. I think the church needs more of the Holy Ghost, the power of God, and the healing agents of God working in the church. We need communities where we can heal. But to heal, you got to be raw. you got to be able to say, I have a problem. I have an issue. And people are going to point it out to you. 
Isn't that the wonderful thing? How many single people are in the room? How many of you want to get married? Wow. Derek, are you looking around? There's a lot of single women in the room. Did, did your liver quiver on any of them? No, not. You're, okay, you got to check with your Shondo. You know the wonderful thing about marriage? It's one of the greatest deliverance tools in the Bible. Because you get connected to this other person, and there's very few things they can do to you that you're allowed to divorce them over. And you're like, I hate them. I know y'all deep prophetic people never said that. But I know some of y'all have said that. Maybe someone on Facebook. I had a spiritual son one time say, I feel like this woman is trying to kill me. I said, she's not trying to kill you, son. God's trying to kill you. God put a woman in your life that don't think like you, don't understand you, and wants you to understand. She wants you to be masculine but still figure out her feminine brain and her needs and all these kind of emotions and all these things. And you're in this thing. And the only thing that can get you through this effectively is God. You need the Holy Spirit and the Bible. This thing right here will cause you to get deep into prayer. Because see, a friend, you can just say, I'm done with you. The Lord spoke to me to move on, but a marriage is a whole other thing. And so God will put you in a relationship like he's in with the church. Paul said, this is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That we do foolish things, God gets us out of it, we go right back and do it again. God gets us out of it, we go right back and do it again. And his love never wavers. Jesus never cuts anybody off. Think about that. He's faithful. He doesn't cut off the witch. But you just read, that was the Old Testament. That was the Old Testament. It's applicable to us for our lifestyle because we're not supposed to be involved in witchcraft. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't cut them off. Jesus doesn't. Isn't it amazing? Jesus won't cut off someone that votes differently than you. We're going to have a whole stirring of the political spirit in America again coming up in about 12 months. Already starting now. People are going to hate each other, yell at each other, scream at each other over all issues that have nothing to do with whether a person gets to heaven or not. I'm not saying they're irrelevant, but the passion people have, that they would literally shoot somebody because they see the world differently than them. If that's not a demon, I don't know what a demon is. And we will cut people off. I got a woman, the first church I planned, they left the church over politics. Just she's repenting, I think, twice now and come back twice. Then that thing will get stirred up and she'll leave again. So if I hear about it, I'm just like, we love you. You just come back whenever you want to come back. We're not going to fight with you about this stuff. But the devil will do that, but Jesus won't cut you off. He won't cut you off. And in the context of community, there's healing. So if we're going to get our souls healed, we got to find the rhythm. we got to get to the roots. And we've got to give ourselves to relationships. Relationships are the tapestry through which God weaves destiny in our lives. What changed the life of Timothy? The presence of Paul. Listen to me closely. What if Timothy had had so much rejection that when Paul moved apostolically, because apostles don't move like teachers. Teachers will explain things. You apostles will just make you do things. Where do you get that from? Look at Paul. Okay, Timothy, you want to travel me? First thing we do, we're going to cut off your foreskin. Someone, anyone have a sharp stone? Wait a minute. I just, I'm not sure. I need to pray about this. No, no, no. We're going to find out your ability to have pain right now because when we get out there, there's going to be a lot of pain if you can't have pain right here. So we're going to cut you right now. Then we're going, we're not, watch this, we're not going to a classroom. See, a teacher will take you in a classroom. An apostle will put you on a field. We go on the field. You're going to learn as you do. 
What if Timothy had had rejection, unresolved, and see the answer to the fatherless condition of Timothy was the presence of a Paul, but Paul did not come with an ushy-gushy love package. Paul came with a demon-fighting, city-shaking package, and he spoke to the depths of who Timothy was. It is when God wants to take us to another level, he sends somebody that is carrying the next level inside of them. But in reality, the packaging might not look the way we thought. It might not sound the way we thought. It might not respond the way we thought. But we've got to see the God in the person that when God answers our prayer, he sends the presence of a person carrying our deliverance, carrying our next level, carrying our assignment, carrying this thing. And many of you are saying, God, do it. And God's saying, I'm doing it right now in the relationship. I'm doing it right now in community. I'm doing it right now in people. I'm doing it right now in your spouse. I'm doing it right now in your family. You see, healing happens in relationships. And what the church has to get better at is we've got to get better at allowing honest pain. You know why, and I'm over time and need to finish, but you know why so many of these preachers are so powerful and then suddenly we find out they've done some crazy immoral thing because they couldn't hurt with honest pain. Because somewhere in our thinking, we develop this mindset. Oh, I can be out here on OnlyFans all week. I could be out here on these dating apps. I could be on here. But the man of God, he don't have no temptation. He don't have the, he don't have, no, no, no. They're working through the same stuff you are. They're facing the same challenges. I'm not discounting character. Paul wrote chapters about the character of elders and bishops and leaders. I believe that. I teach that. I advocate that. But we need to be able to say, you know what? I'm not okay. Our churches need to have preaching teams. We cannot be apostolic, and I'm just the only one preaching. We cannot be apostolic, and, and where it's just I'm just coming for apostle. No, we have to have teams because this is what burns people out. We need to hear from different voices. We need to hear from different leaders. But we have put our leaders on a pedestal, and they can't honestly bleed in front of us. Now, if we do that with our leaders, how much less can we, the people of God, bleed? We need to be able to come and say, you know what? Today, I almost just gave up on everything. Because in context of community, there's healing that is available. But you will never get deliverance or healing without honesty. Every person that ever came to Jesus and got delivered or healed had to be honest. What about the woman that had five husbands and Jesus said, the man you're with now is not your husband. She was on her sixth man in the chain of broken relationships. She could have got angry with Jesus. She could have been offended with Jesus. But instead she said, I perceive you are a prophet. He spoke down to the root system and tonight the deliverance is coming for the root system. The root system of of pain. The root system system of bondage, the root system of rejection, the root system of fear, but God is trying to elevate our mind to understand that healing happens in community. Deliverance happens in community. The Spirit of the Lord is knitting us with people where we can be honest. Sometimes after I preach, and I'm all alone, this voice will begin to talk to me and say, well, you should have said this. You, you got too loud and hooped at the wrong part and you should have not done that and you should have done this and you should have done that. You know, their, their voice might try to say, you shouldn't have used a whiteboard. That was boring. Da, 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 da. And I carried that for years all by myself. I would have never told that. And I was watching Bishop Jakes preach one day and he said, you know, sometimes after I preach, this voice starts talking to me. And I said, my God, my God, somebody else's admission of pain gave me permission towards freedom because I was carrying it by myself and some of you have been carrying it by yourself and God wants to meet you and God wants to uproot pain and God wants to uproot fear and God wants to uproot bondage listen some of you have been carrying attractions because you were molested it's not your fault 
It's not your fault. And look, if I could be honest with you, this battle you're in, it may not be undone in a night. It may not be undone in a month. It might not be undone in six months. Who put timetables on the process of healing? Who puts timetables on the process of deliverance? You know, I, I fell and hurt my shoulder in, in December, and it's I'm still working through it. It's much better, 90% better, but I've learned that sometimes you just have to rest in healing. You can't. I kept saying, I want to work it out. I want to do this. They said, no, you got to rest it for you to get healed. You got to rest that thing. Sometimes you just got to rest in what God is doing in your life. You don't understand. Why am I getting prayer and still having attraction over here? Why am I getting prayer and still fighting these thoughts over here? First of all, thoughts are not indication of bondage. Thoughts are indication of temptation. And the Bible said that every man is tempted, but God provides a way of escape. So if you are tempted, all that is is a confirmation. You got breath in your body, but God is able to deliver you. God is able to heal you. God is able to raise you up. Up, but quit putting a timetable on your deliverance. I hear the Holy Ghost saying tonight, break the timetable. Break the timetable. I hear the Holy Ghost saying tonight, your deliverance is in my hand, in my time, in my power. It's okay to bleed. It's okay to weep. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be frustrated. But trust me, saith the Lord. And as you trust me, I'm working in your life. Somebody tell your neighbor, neighbor, God's working. Come on, you might not see it, neighbor, but I'm turning into a different man or a different woman. When you see me this time next year, I'm going to talk different. I'm going to look different. I'm going to move different. I know it's been a long time, but I feel my help coming tonight. I feel the power from on high coming tonight. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is helping us tonight. The Holy Ghost, our helper. Someone shout unto the Lord. I feel help hitting this building tonight. It's okay to bleed. Will you just take that off the stage? Go ahead and begin to play. Let us not be so prophetic that we are trying to be perfect. Let us not be so prophetic that other people can't bleed in front of us. Let us not be so prophetic that other people can't open their wound and say, I need healing. Every person I read about that came to Jesus for deliverance and healing was honest with the Lord. And honesty attracted the power of God. God's strength is made perfect. In the presence of your weakness, in your vulnerability, you've been thinking what God wanted was your strength, but what God really wanted was your honesty. What God really wanted was your transparency. What God really wanted was your desperation. It's okay to bleed. But see, we think if I'm going to be up here, I got to have it all together. I remember a preacher I knew years ago. Turquoise actually knows him and was the first person to say his name. And when he was a child, he was severely molested as a man. He was a, I don't know the right term, a male prostitute. I was trying to think of the right term. And I remember when he got delivered and he became a preacher, we were talking one day and he said, I don't go to the beach. I said, why? He said, I can't handle that environment. It's too much for my eyes. And I thought, he's a whole preacher, casting demons out. I mean, one of the strongest demon caster outers I've ever seen in my life, casting demons out right and left. But he was okay to bleed in front of other people and say, this is where I'm at in my journey. The right rhythm. When you're working through your deliverance, there's certain environments you can't be in. There's certain spaces you can't be in. There's certain profiles you can't look at. There's certain DMs you can't answer. They're asking for prayer, but that ain't really what they want. You got to discern that. You got to close that door. <laughs> 